Hey guys, this is Suzanne Light sitting out here on my porch in this gorgeous pre-spring weather. We could very well still have some cold weather, but right now it's gorgeous. And I just had to come out here. I didn't want to sit in the house and teach today when outside was so gorgeous. We're going to pick right back up in the book of John. We, this is our fourth lesson. So if you're seeing this one first, go back. I have a playlist called the book of John. Go back and start at the beginning because the beginning, John 1, 1 is just such some deep stuff about the word of God. And, um, we are just, we just go to a certain point of this and then stop. So many of you have said that you're enjoying it. I know that the algorithms are really keeping it from getting out to a lot of people, but God is going to let see these lessons who need to see. But now, if you are not subscribed, you need to so that you know, because I'm going to be going through John. Um, I've showed you in the other books, this is what I'm doing. I'm dissecting verse by verse, and I'm loving this. I'm just taking every minute that I can to study it because it's so interesting to me. But feel free to share it. I know Teresa Nance shared it on her Facebook the other day, and that would be great if there's people that you want to reach because, listen, we all need the Word of God. And a lot of people have told me they like the simplistic way that I teach, just like sitting down and sharing. And that's what I want to do. That's, that's my style of teaching, is just to talk about what the scriptures say and how they apply to our lives. That's what it's all about, guys. So we're going to pick right back up. We're still in chapter one. <laughs> we're going to get out of chapter one pretty soon, very soon. As a matter of fact, we may even get out of chapter one today. But we're going to finish up chapter one, and we're going to start with uh, verse 35. I'm not going to go back to where we were on the last lesson. You can. I hope you're keeping notes and I hope that you are um, looking and reading along with me. I'm in the ESV, but you can follow along in any that you want to. So Jesus calls his first disciples, okay? The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. We did reference that's the way he introduced him in the paragraph above. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Right off, we find out in this that two of John's disciples immediately start following Jesus. Was this a problem to John? Absolutely not. This is what he was grooming people for. It was not a, um, a an authority type thing. It was not a control thing. He, I'm sure he was elated that they just picked up and started following Jesus. And once again, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. So he may have introduced Jesus every time th that we know of, because this is two times in a row, right, in these scriptures that he has said, behold, the Lamb of God. And in the paragraph before, who takes away the sins of the world. In verse 38, he turned to those disciples and said, what are you seeking? In other words, what are you doing? What do you want? What do you want out of this? And you know, personally, that's what Jesus is asking of us. What are you seeking? What do you want to get out of this? What do you want to get out of your relationship with Christ? What is your desire? Is your desire just to be classified with him? Or is your desire to really know him intimately? 
And I assure you, my goal is to know him intimately and for him to know me intimately and for my every thought to be consumed with the Almighty God. That, And I'll tell you, when you start studying the Bible like this, your thoughts are consumed with what you've studied, what you've gone over. Um, so, you know, he'll ask of us, what are you seeking? What are you truly seeking? Some people go to church because it is the socially correct thing to do. That don't mean a hill of beans. That don't mean nothing. Some people give large amounts of money for tax breaks to churches, and that's a wonderful thing to do. But with what spirit are you giving it in? So he's, he's asking us, what are you seeking? It appears here that Andrew just knew immediately that this was the Messiah. He had an insight to that. He knew because as soon as he met him, he went to find his brother to tell him about it. So let's go on to verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, now Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. So when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered in him, Because I said I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe me? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So, what Nathaniel immediately looked upon when when um, when Philip told him that this was Jesus of Nazareth, he said, "Can anything good come out of Nazareth?" He was being prejudiced. He was being prejudiced, and you know he was very skeptical. But Nathaniel didn't didn't argue with him, but just invited him to come meet Jesus for himself. Well, it didn't take much for Jesus to con. Vince, Nathaniel, he just said, I, I, I saw you under the fig tree. And he said, well, I believe you're the Messiah. <laughs> and he said, uh, because I saw, said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe. But I believe it was much, much more than that. I believe it was a spiritual connection that Nathaniel saw and experienced and felt and witnessed. And then these other disciples were there also. But I think... Um, <laughs> There's a song that says, Jesus, something special, supernatural about that name, Jesus. And so it was almost like something supernatural happened to Nathaniel to just automatically turn him around and to believe that he was the Messiah. But Jesus said, hey... If you believe this, you're going to see much greater things coming. So he won him over. He, we don't know how, we don't know the specifics. We just know that Nathaniel's heart was changed. Now we're going to move on to chapter two, and we're going to talk about where the very first miracle that Jesus performs was at the wedding of Cana. And there is so much meat in this. There is so much to this story. So I'm going to start reading it, and then I'll go back and kind of dissect some of it and tell you what I have found in reading it. The wedding at Cana, uh, John 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman? What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. 
His mother said to the servants, <laughs> she just ignored what he just said. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Okay. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So what they would do, and when I had looked it up, they would start out at the weddings with the finest of wine that they could afford. And then as the palate became accustomed to that, then they would water down the wine. They did not, they, they couldn't afford. And these uh, receptions sometimes would go on for like three days. So they had to serve the wine at the beginning when they started drinking the very best. And it was um, absolutely a huge major social mistake if the bridegroom and bride ran out of wine. It was just not acceptable during that time. You had to plan. It was a huge thing. So, first of all, for Jesus to be invited to this wedding said something. Yes, his mother was there. Yes, she was helping. But Jesus and his disciples were also invited, which says something about the kind of man that Jesus was for people to want to invite them to their wedding. So she says, woman, what? When, when she told him, she said, they've ran out of wine. And he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And she said, he said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In other words, I have not started manifesting miracles. Even with respect, Jesus said, he wasn't disrespectful to her when he said woman, but what he was doing, he was speaking to her as the son of God. He didn't say, mother, what do you want me to do? He said, woman. Some think in the commentaries that I read that this is exactly when the relationship between Jesus and and his mother changed. And she knew by what happened. And he knew by calling her woman. That the relationship was changing. Because he can't do anything without consulting his heavenly father. So he wasn't disrespecting his earthly mother when he called her woman. But he was saying woman. In other words, I have got to refer to my father. On this. Now, it doesn't say that he stopped and he prayed. It doesn't say anything like that. But he had to have affirmation from God the Father because this, you know, would be his first miracle that he would perform. And also, you got to remember that in the public, he was the Son of Man. So there, you know, there was constantly a comparison between the physical and the spiritual realm of where he was. Also, when, when uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, said to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. These were words, not bossing them around, these were words to glorify Jesus, not herself. This had nothing to do with her. It was all about glorifying him. You know, did she have insight that something like that was fixing to happen? What did... Blackbirds. <laughs> They've always kind of freaked me out. They probably don't like the Word of God being taught here. <laughs> I think it has to do with that uh, 
Alfred Hitchcock movie, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> I digress. Um, and so I was wondering in this, wonder what she expected Jesus to do. Did she know that something miraculous was going to happen? I think so. I may be wrong. That's just my personal opinion. But she told him she knew he was going to do something. And she said, whatever he says to do, do it. So this is where I feel like a very special part came in. Jesus could have spoken and the jars could have been automatically filled with new wine. He was performing a miracle and he could have done it, but he didn't do it. What he did, he included the servants in this miracle. This was a part of a conversion for them. They witnessed something that the bride and groom did not even see. They knew that they filled those jars with water. Okay? They did as Jesus said. It also had to take a lot of guts to when Jesus told them to go over and to serve the wine, them in their mind knowing this is not wine, we have just filled this with water. But they go over and when they pour it, can you imagine, I've never thought about this till I studied this. Can you imagine how those servants felt? He said there was 20 or 30 gallons. So we're talking 20 or 30 servants serving these jars and probably, you know, we don't know, but that's how many they filled up. And can you imagine when they first poured that and it was wine coming out, what shock must have been there, what amazement, even what relief <laughs> that they were not pouring water because they probably would have been attacked as servants. So Jesus allowed the lower class, the servants, the ordinary people to be involved in his first miracle. He allowed them to know that they obeyed him. They just obeyed him. They didn't have anything to do with the miracle other than obeying. And um, they obeyed him and then they were really the first ones who got to witness firsthand the miracle that Jesus did. They obeyed. Jesus did the miracle, but Jesus allowed them to be a part of it. I just think that is beautiful, that he allowed them to be a part of it. So like I said, it took a lot of faith for them to serve it in the first place, knowing they put water in it. But then Jesus allowed them to know the greatness of the miracle. It wasn't even just wine. It was great wine. And so everyone that obeyed him got to participate in the miracle that he performed. And this knowledge was such a blessing for them. I cannot imagine this knowledge not transforming their life completely. And you know, that's the way it is today. When we are obedient to the things that he tells us to do, and we see lives change, we see burdens lifted. You know, one of the hardest things to do as a Christian is to step out of your comfort zone. In the grocery store, the Lord is liable to tell you to go up and tell somebody to tell them that God loves them. I was in Hobby Lobby one day, and I think I shared this with y'all. Mother was actually with me. And there was a lady there picking out flowers, and I was picking out some flowers. And she said, this is for my daughter's, her son's grave. And I said, I am so sorry. And I could immediately tell from that woman talking that she was a broken, broken woman. And the Holy Spirit just immediately told me, you need to pray with her in Hobby Lobby. And there were people around. There were people that actually 
walked in behind us while I was praying for her. I, I looked up and saw him coming through there. But I believe without a doubt that that was a God moment when I absolutely, that God provided the solution. God is the answer of prayers. I was just obedient. And my mother, when we walked away, because my mother's a very reserved person in her spiritual life, she has been. And when we walked away, she said, you amazed me. And I said, what mother? And she said, you amazed me that you have the boldness to do that. And she said, that touched that woman. And I said, I know, and I was just in tears. And I said, but mother, it's not boldness. It's just doing something that I feel that the Holy Spirit speaks to me right then and there. Why else would he allow me to come up on a woman trying to pick out flowers for her son that was passed away? That was my moment to minister to her. And if I had missed that moment, I would have missed that blessing. And I also, like I said, when we pray, God, Jesus, they answer the prayers. They do the work. But if I had not been obedient, he may have had somebody else in Hobby Lobby to pray over her that day if I hadn't had. But I was honored and I knew without a doubt. And the more you step out in faith, the more you do it, the more God will use you. And the more you will know the voice of the Holy Spirit, please, if the Lord impresses upon you to go to call somebody, to send them a card, to text somebody, you've had them in your mind, you might have dreamed about them the night before, do it. Because listen, the enemy's not going to tell you to do anything good for somebody else. So don't worry about that. It's not going to be the enemy. It's going to be the Lord telling you, go and minister to that person. There have been times that people have just said something simple to me, but it directly connected with something I was going through and it changed my whole attitude. And if they had not obeyed God, and then there's been times that I have spoken to people that I didn't feel like they received it but I still knew, and it's hard. Y'all, your heart will start beating. You, you let the Lord tell you to go up to somebody in the grocery store and pray for them. You never know. We, we only see the outward facade of people. We don't know what's really going on the inside, but God does. And to me, this is so indicative of what Jesus did by letting the lowly servants take part in such an amazing thing. He wants us to be able to do the same thing. I, I, I think this is a beautiful story. And, and when I read, I told John about it. I said, John, let me tell you, I'm reading some of these commentaries, what I found. And John said, Suzanne, I've never thought about that. He actually used the lowliest of the crowd there, the servants, to help bring forth his miracle. And I said, he did. And he wants to do that for us. He wants to do that for you. He wants to use you. He wants to bless you. And I thank God for that insight because all I've ever known about is that he turned the water into wine. Now that's amazing. It's amazing. Turn the water into wine. What, what a beautiful thing. But even more beautiful he allowed others to participate, to be blessed, to be amazed, and to be converted. I'm going to stop here, and we're going to pick up where Jesus cleanses the temple. But hey, we're in chapter 2, so we're doing good. Until next time, I pray that these are blessing y'all. I guess maybe they're as much for me as they are for you, because I am learning so much. But you have told me. You know, I'm going over this with my husband. We're reading John together. We're watching this together. One lady I haven't even had a chance to respond said I'm at work and I'm looking at my computer screen with tears in my eyes because she had just watched it. So that blesses me. And I just pray that more and more people will be blessed by this, what it's all about. It has nothing to do with Suzanne Light at all. Nothing to do with Suzanne Light. Nothing. I am just his messenger, and I am honored to be used by him. 
Until next time, I love you guys. May the Lord bless you. And keep reading and keep growing in the Word of God. I love you guys. Bye.